Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. And uh, first of all, thank you for finding the time to join, to join this uh, conversation. And I hope at the end uh, of it, you might, uh, let's say, you might go to bed thinking that you didn't waste your time. Um, we, we talked with Ryan uh, before uh, agreeing to do this uh, about the subject that we want to touch. And uh, uh, we came down to the idea of going over uh, our pick and roll offense and our pick and roll defense this year in Milano. And uh, uh, that can give you an idea of what we faced uh, offensively and defensively in the EuroLeague, which, as I know, as you know, is a very um, challenging competition. Um, after five years uh, being away from Europe, um, I found a league which is probably a little bit more offensive oriented. Uh, we we used to have a very very aggressive and physical defenses. Um, we still have that, but but offense like in all the teams in the world, whether it's the NBA or FIBA basketball, are more and more influenced in their state of mind by, by what they do offensively and how effective they are offensively. And uh, players want to score, wants to play, wants to shoot, wants to pass, want to pass, want to be aggressive. And if they feel that they don't have any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, momentum or chemistry offensively, these affect the defense of all teams. And overall, uh, I've seen in the EuroLeague better offenses and a little bit less of defensive commitment, just starting with the basic things like pressure on the ball, physicality, fighting the, fighting the screens. Anyhow, as you will know, the EuroLeague is a competition where every game is played with a high level of drama. Uh, the competition is very tight and uh, to win or lose one or two or three games in a row can make a huge difference in, ter in terms of standings. So uh, every possession is very, very important. Uh, almost nobody runs any kind of early offense uh, after a made field goal. Everybody likes to go into set plays. Uh, somebody does it better, some, somebody does it uh, less well. Um, somebody does it with more speed, somebody does it a little bit more slowly. But overall, I would say, that this league is more a half-court league offensive. So defensively, uh, uh, you will obviously have to face this kind of situation. We will go over that in a second. Before I start showing the clips, I would like just to make a point uh, of what I think is important uh, that we keep in mind once we start watching clips. Uh, personally, I think that spacing and timing are the two most important uh, data that we want to check when we watch something. Uh, space is important. The, the, the court is getting smaller and smaller. The players are getting bigger and faster. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's very, very important that we space the team space well offensively. And a lot of teams have used the, the four corners uh, spacing especially when they play when they play pick and roll. The other thing you want to do offensively is you want to have timing. I, when I talk about timing, I mean that in our sport, everything happens while something else is finishing. I my, The ball leaves my hand for a pass while you're getting open. So you get to the spot, and at the same time, the ball gets there. Uh, I don't wait for you to be in some specific spot and then I execute the pass because that will be bad timing. Somebody will deflect or even deny that pass. Uh, you scream and while I'm dribbling the ball, you roll to the rim or you pop. Everything is wild. Wild is constant. And uh, to have the right timing in passing, cutting, screening, uh, allows the offense, once you have created the advantage, to maintain that, and that advantage. If you do not have the right timing, the defense can stop, break your execution, and 
uh, take away the advantage that you just created. So spacing and timing are extremely important, I, I, I always believe. So talking about pick and roll, uh, you have this first clip. Uh, set, set the defense. Set the defense, set your defender away from the screen, use the crossover, use the reject. I think it's very, very important that we work daily with all our perimeter players to emphasize how the preparation of a screen and roll action is very, very important. Um, we, we can never be, let's say, we can never go short in that. for me to keep in mind that we can talk about you know organizational strategy whatever but basic fundamentals have always to be uh, kept in mind and you always have to work in that regardless of the level that you play a situation where the defense is aggressive with a show or with a hedge or whatever you want to call it Okay, so depending on the different defenses that you face, where you pass the ball can, let's say, extend the possibility for you to, to keep the advantage that you create. Uh, on a pick and roll action or a switch of first or a hedge of first, so you have an aggressive defense, uh, I would like to encourage the throw ahead pass. Okay, and a diagonal roll by the center right to the middle of the paint because this will suck in the two defenders from the corners, okay? And as you see in this clip, the throw ahead pass to Kiefer Sykes, number 28, allows him to have a direct pass to the, to the big or he might swing to the corner to number five midfield for a shot, okay? Next clip, you see the Biliga, Paul Biliga, number six, instead of rolling diagonally, he goes directly to the block, okay? And that will allow, will allow his, the defender of Moraschini, who's right standing in front of the coach here, to the defend, his defender will be able to stunt and get back. Luckily, in this clip, he get caught by Biliga and he cannot get back in time to the shooter. But you see there is a very, very short you know, uh, path for the defender to touch Beliga and get back. If Beliga would have been in the middle of the paint, it would have been a much longer run for the defender of the shooter, and it would be almost impossible to get back to him. So again, my point is against aggressive defense, we like the diagonal roll more than going to the block and the throw ahead pass. I'm muted. He said I'm muted now. Same thing here. Aggressive defense, roll, and now we have another thing. I think the pick and roll is an action that you need to use to start a little bit, create a little bit of advantage, and then hopefully start a drive and kick game if you don't have an open shot. And this clip is quite good. And by the way, I would like to say this. Of course, I, I pulled, my assistant coaches were, did a great job and they pulled only great clips. So we look very, very good. Unfortunately, we didn't do this all the time. We were very uh, up and down. But what you see now, I think it's a good clip because you see creating the advantage here with Sergio Rodriguez. The ball is thrown ahead. And now Vlado Mitzel can throw it to the corner. He can attack his man or he can skip it. And Nedovic, he's driving the rotation to find an open shot. Another thing that we work versus hedge when we were screening with our four men, in this clip is Luis Scola that played the four for us. With the four men, we encouraged a lot the short roll and we had the second big at the dunker. That means the dunker is the position down low, right outside, one step outside the paint. And you see now the defense is very aggressive on Rodriguez and here's the short roll, the pocket here, the high low, from Luis to Caleb Tarceski, and the shooter would be open on the same side. 
So we made a distinction when we play pick and roll with the five men, we try to have the four corner space. When we play pick and roll with the four against help and recover against hedge, we try to create this different spacing with the five men at the dunker. And we try to use more the short ball. Again, this was the plan in theory. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. We're just talking about, let's say, principles now. Then, after the first part of the season, where we faced a lot of aggressive defense, we started slowly to face more and more uh, a softer defense, whether it was a drop or a push, but no aggressiveness like we faced in the beginning of the year. Uh, at one point, it looked like the whole league, both Italy and Euroleague, was a little bit, a little going in a different direction. So here we start talking about the drop, what we thought about the drop. Of course, you can use the drop to, to get an open shot, which is very, very basic. But please, I would like to show you the spacing that we use in these actions when we attack a drop. And this is something that we did not do very well. I think in most of pick and roll actions, the play, in this case, uh, Jeff Brooks, number 12, the player who's peeling behind the action, most of the times is the player who's open. Regardless what kind of defensive rotation you are facing, this player that would receive a throwback pass, most of the time is the open guy, especially when you run an elbow pick and roll, okay? And I think, I think for a guard, it's important to master these three passes. The pocket pass for a, to a short roller, the pass behind the pick and roll, and the skip pass to the opposite corner. I think those three passes have to, uh, are the three passes that are key. If you execute them well, of course, I mean, when I say execute, means that you see which pass is available, and then you have the technique to execute that pass. I think those are keys to give you an opportunity to really uh, exploit the advantage that you create with the pick and roll. Now you see that Michael Roll, my guard, is taking an open shot or a good shot off the dribble. But I like to emphasize that, that Jeff Brooks and Ricardo Moraschini in the lower part of the video here are open. And we were not that good all year long. We were not consistent in that. This is a concept that we really work a lot. Stop. Versus a drop, when you have two players, Michael Roll and Vlado Mitzel here, we asked our players, when you had two players in vision of the ball handler, we asked the baseline guy to cut in order to be able to attack the shift. The card of Istanbul that he is staying with Roll because he doesn't want an easy kick there, okay? And that gives Sergio Rodriguez an open shot. You will see in the following clips more and more clearly this idea. You will have now another situation of pick and roll. Four, five, and watch Drew Crawford. Drew Crawford here on the baseline, here, he sees the drop and he leaves a little late. He leaves a little late, and as a result, Sergio Rodriguez is still on the wing and allows Malcolm Delaney to take away the pass and at the same time to clock the middle here. And as a result of that, we have a tough situation here that ends up in a jump shot, but it's a contested shot. Against the drop, we encourage the rescreen to change the spacing. And I will go over that in a second. And you see now, you don't see in the clip, you don't see Kiefer Sykes, but Kiefer Sykes is wide open at the top of the key. And again, let me insist on that. That throwback to the player who's at the top of the key, most time is the pass that is open for a three-point shot. One thing that I would like to say is that it's important that we assume one very basic concept. Uh, 
we determine we determine the spacing that we like in an offensive situation, whether it's a pick and roll or a post up or whatever. But the defense will start reacting. And because of that, I think where we need to make an effort to get better is, to, is, is in adjusting the spacing through the course of the action. Through the course of the action, we got to be able to see what the defense is doing and what we need to do in terms of moving on the perimeter to create new, a better spacing for the offense. We cannot assume that at, let's say, at the normal level of good defense, the spacing that you have at the beginning of the action will continue to be the same for the 24 seconds. I know it might sound weird or complicated, but it's not that complicated. It's one of the many, many, let's say, uh, um, way of declining the concept of read and react. You don't only read and react with the ball or uh, with a cut or what you react also in understanding where you have to go in order to create space for your teammates. I think it's very, very important. This clip, which is very basic, okay, Nemanja Nedovic catches it and he goes the other way. So immediately you see a counterclock rot uh, rotation of the offensive players. Luis Cola should drift quickly to the corner. Okay, number 28, Kiefer Sykes should sprint to the top of the key. And number 20, Cincerini should be open. And if they don't stay helping on the roller, of course, Kalev Tarceski is open inside. But everything is related to adjusting the space. Here we go. This is another example of adjusting the spacing in the course of the action. Sergio Rodriguez comes and against the drop, even if the defense does not go under, against the drop, likes to have the wrist screen. And that changes completely the spacing. Watch now. Luis Cola screens, Rodriguez catches it. If he attacks, if he turns the corner or he goes for a jump shot, Tarceski, the center, will roll and Luis Scola will be behind the play. But because you see this, the wrist screen action, immediately Scola should sprint to the corner. Here we go. And he creates spacing. The center rolls, and Vlado Mitzel is already peeling behind the screen, behind the action, you see? You don't even see him. And that allows the shooter in the, at the break to be open. It's very, very basic. But I think it's effective. Again, and that's another situation of 0.5 that we talk. When I say 0.5, I steal this terminology to coach Popovich and uh, the Spurs coaching staff. 0.5 means that when you, when you receive the ball, you should be, while the ball is in the air and it's coming to your hands, you should already be able to have an idea if you can drive your man or if you have an open shot, or if you, should, you can just swing the ball to another player, which is in a better position. Basically, 0.5 is a concept that says you only have half of a second. You cannot catch it and hold it and then see what happened and then take a decision because that will make the offense lose the advantage and that will make the offense becoming stagnant. So the concept of 0.5 is, let's say, shown very clearly here. Again, the player behind the pick and roll is the guy that is open, quick swing and quick drive. Drew Crawford doesn't hold the ball, he catches it and goes. Again, versus drop. And here's the pass. Again, I wanna, here it looks great. I must be sincere. I would have loved us to be much more consistent in looking for that pass. We were not consistent in doing that. But the, if we can sum, uh, summarize what we discussed until now, we have said that against aggressive defense, we like the ball to be thrown ahead. Okay? Against drops, okay, you like the ball to, to be thrown behind the roller. Again, the concept that we used before, 
here's the pick and roll or the DHO, which is the same concept, okay? And Chacho Rodriguez has, comes out. It's a drop. We're attacking a drop. The Lavalle number zero, zero, at the beginning of the action, he sees that there is a drop and he leaves the corner. And that allows number nine, Moraschini, to get to the corner. So now the defender of Moraschini, if he stays here and keeps staying in shift, will give up a three-point shot in the corner. If he drops down to take care of Moraschini, that opens up spacing for Sergio Rodriguez. Okay, imagine if in the same situation versus a drop, we stay with number nine Moraschini here and number zero, zero in the corner. If we stay and we hold our position, this defender would be here over shifting against Sergio Rodriguez and taking away all the spacing for the offense. You will see in the next clip the same concept against the watch. Watch Vlado Mitov in the corner. He's leaving because he sees the stun here and the two players here. What I would like to see here in this clip is Kiefer Sykes, number 28, sprinting to the baseline. But in this case, he settled. You see, he settled for a jump shot. Imagine if he would have sprinted to the baseline, that would have been an open shot because Campazzo is here helping on the ball ender. He's over shifting here. Okay? It's a very simple concept of how attacking the shift defender. I think the shift defender is probably the most important player that we must know how to attack how to take advantage of his good defensive behavior. Again, let me insist on this. Watch now. Watch the big man in the corner out of white, okay? He sees the defense over stunting, okay? The defender, Kalinic, defender of Michael Wall, he's here getting ready to stunt and shift against Sergio Rodriguez. But because the corner player leaves, that allows Michael Roll to drift to the corner, towards the corner, and get an open shot. Very basic, but I think against the drop, is very, very, very effective. One more time here. Now we go even back to the other side. So instead, in this clip, you see the same thing. Watch Moraschini here in the upper part of the video. He sees De La Valle attacking the drop and the defender of Sergio Rodriguez is already here in shift. So he clears the, bla the baseline, okay? He goes. And we peel behind because Sergio Rodriguez is defended, is taken by, Sergio Rodri by Ricardo Moraschini defender here. He stays because he sees Rodriguez open so I think the offense, the offense does the right thing to swing it back and they hit Moraskin in the corner and now he has a good 0.5, he drives the close up. And at the end of it, we talked at the beginning that we need to master different passes, the pocket pass, the skip pass, and the throwback pass, especially on side pick and roll against a, a drop now we always saw middle pick and roll, basically, where the ball was going to the middle from the slot. Now you see a side pick and roll, and here you see Moraschini using a nice pocket pass. And I think it's important that we focus, we focus our uh, players in understanding which fundamentals can help them quickly to become more effective within the offense that we're running. Uh, talking, about, talking about adjusting the spacing, there was another topic that I touched in this conversation. You have now an example against the weak, okay? They're trying, Barcelona is weaking Sergio Rodriguez. Both games we played against them, they tried to force really hard Sergio and our point guards to their left hand, okay? 
And during the game, they could be in a drop or in a much more aggressive stance with the big. And here, you see, okay, that's pretty nice. I think my point is, watch how the kids adjust the spacing, okay? Theoretically, in this screen, Caleb Tarceski should have rolled, uh, Jeff Brooks should have popped, and we should have gone second side. That doesn't happen for whatever reason, okay? And because now the foreman is going there and there is a reject, on the reject, immediately they adjust their space. Tarceski goes to the rim because he sees Tomic here getting ready to defend the penetration, and that leaves two on one Michael Rowe on the backside. Another adjustment in the spacing on a quick read by the offense. You see this. So they weak our guards. Here we are. They weak. They send to his left hand, Vlado Mitzel, here. Okay. So Gudaitis flips the angle of his screen, which is pretty nice. And against aggressive defense on their own, Vlado Mitzel recognized that he needs to throw the ball ahead to Luis Scola. And from a difficult situation, my players managed how to, how to get a bucket. Finally, the third defense that we attacked during the year was the push, where the defense were try was trying to send our ball ender towards the sideline or toward the basin. And uh, we tried to keep it simple. Uh, we tried to uh, give a simple instruction. Our four men was popping, our five men was rolling, or if he was not involved in, in the screening action, was diving. Uh, I wish, I wish I had used more a pick and pop of the five men and go second side action right away. But I didn't do it. I didn't want to complicate too much. Our, our reads and our offense. And uh, I, I, I'm think, I'm, I would like to do that next year when the player will, will be more used to, to the offense. But here you see what I just mentioned before. Pick and roll with four, defense on the sideline, try to force the ball ender to the baseline. Okay, so now we pop the four and immediately the five man, wherever he, wherever he is, he tries to create a connection with the foreman. Now, Caleb Tarceski was high, so he dives. If we would have been low at the dunker, he would have been ducking in here to try to give an, a pass, a passing line to Luis Cola. But here it comes pretty nice. Here we go, good timing, and we finish with a layup. But the concept is create, try to create uh, try to create a, a passing, a passing, a combination between the two bigs. Uh, as for other things that we try to do against the push, we try, as I said, to roll the five as much as we could, use the pop man, the four man as, a, as a, an outlet in order to create the ILO or swing it and go second side. And finally, we had to work a lot on switching. Switching uh, all over the world, whether it's the NBA, or FIBA basketball is becoming bigger and bigger. And uh, honestly, we, we were not very good against switches. We struggled. One thing that we worked on was, and you will see now here, in trying, in trying to use the direct pass. Here we go. It's not, it's not happening all the time, but I think that the direct pass from the ball handler especially if you have a big ball handler like uh, Vlado Mitzov here, who's about 6'7", I think it's a good thing to try to go and look for a direct pass. Keep the, big, keep the small behind you and just go high-low, basically, rather than make another pass and try to get a, a feed from the wing. I think when you attack switches, if you can keep a little bit more a focus on going high-low from the middle, it prevents the, uh, or at least makes more difficult the triple switch or makes more difficult the weak side rotation that will cover the small who's taking the big. 
while if you throw the ball to the wing, it's easier from the weak side to flood and release the small, like you will see later in, in one of our defensive clips. And again, another, the same concept we used before against hedge is to roll diagonally. Against the switch, here we go. Roll diagonally in the middle of the paint. Keep your man behind you, go diagonal, and if somebody wants to create a triple switch, if somebody that wants to create a triple switch and release the small who's guarding Luis Cola here, okay, that will probably give up the three-point shot from the three. But again, the clever passer is here because he made the high-low pass, which is the most difficult to cover. And again, and keep in mind also that against the switch, there is always an opportunity to use the short pocket pass like against a normal situation. If you screen well, if you screen well, and you keep the big behind, the small behind, like Paul Beliga is doing now here, that still gives you the pocket pass. Like if you're attacking a drop or a regular uh, pick and roll coverage, okay? Sometimes we become passive and on the switch, the screener allows the small to get back in front of him or to hold him and don't let him roll easily to the block or to the position that he wants. And if you can also, if you have the right, the right player there, you can hit him on the roller. And I think it's a nice action here with a 0.5. Of course, I mean, we were not, we were not doing that consistently through the year and we need to get better. And I'm sure you understand that these are only, let's say, a bunch of very, very good clips. Uh, if you like, if you like, we can make, a, a, let's say, a timeout and, and answer or discuss your questions related to the pick and roll offense. And then we'll move to the pick and roll defense. Ryan, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think something that's Im important for. A lot of coaches, I just in my experience of, of being in Europe, I think two things they teach really well against switching. Uh, in the first clip, as, as they threw the, the pass down the alley, oftentimes in America, when we teach attacking the switch, we have the guard back up, kind of like what Tony Parker would do a lot in San Antonio. And in Europe, I, I think they're so good at not having the guard release the big meaning right once you back up you take away that diagonal pass down the middle and I think in Europe they do such a good job of of making the guard engage the big so they can make the pass and then the other thing and in, in the way that the big set the screen oftentimes against switching which I I think is taught really well is a screen with their top shoulder so that way when they roll they're automatically underneath the switching defense and I, I thought those were two really good concepts that I learned from being in Europe that, that I hadn't seen taught so much in America that I think is something we can take away. Uh, yes, well, I, honestly, I, 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 I don't want to make, you know, uh, uh, let's say um, a discussion whether we teach better or in America they teach better or whatever. I, I just, honestly, I just don't care. I think there are great teachers all over the world, and uh, there are uh, all over the uh, situations where you don't see maybe the attention, the details that you might like. So um, I think that overall, it's a great concept to use the top shoulder. Like it's a great concept uh, to know if you're, the player you're screening for is not a great shooter, and you know that they will try to go under. And in that case, you need to screen the ass of your defender, of, of his defender. You don't want to screen the side, the shoulder of that player. You want to screen his butt. So if he tries to go under, he cannot drop step and go under. And you basically create a situation for your guard, even or your perimeter player, even if he's not a shooter, to still be at the of the dribble. Sometimes you see, unfortunately, that uh, 
will set a screen for a non-shooter and they screen the defender exactly perpendicularly on the shoulder of the defender. So it's very easy for the guy to drop step and go under. Okay. So those things, I think it's important to, uh, to spend a little, a little bit of time. And uh, it's not easy because we, we play a lot of games. Practice is not there. But I, I, I think that individual instruction or what you call in, Amer in America player development, I mean, to dedicate those 20, 30 minutes every day to these uh, small details that can make your offense better and your players better, I think it's the most important thing. And also, it helps a lot to create uh, a bond between the coaches and the players because the player understands that you're taking care of them and try to make him better and a better player, uh, a guy that, that can be more effective on the, on the court and maybe get more playing time. I, I mean, I think it's just a big part of, uh, uh, of coaching. And I, and I think everybody tries to do that. Somebody has less time, somebody has less assistance, somebody has less people involved. And I understand it's not easy for everybody. All of us, we would love to be like in an NBA organization with an extended staff, uh, a great practice facility, a lot of time. But, you know, it's, it's not like this for everybody. Does anyone have any questions for Coach Messina about uh, the pick and roll offense? Yeah. Hey, Coach. Um, hey, Will. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Still waiting. You and your team coming to Calgary. <laughs> it's still waiting for the day. Still waiting for the day. <laughs> Great to see you. Great you too. To see you. Uh, quick question. So um, you talked about the cut baseline when you have an overload side. I'm just curious, with the next coverage, do you have any other points of emphasis for your offense other than that baseline cut? I call it next pick and roll, but, you know, like, like perimeter only, right, where the nail defender will switch to take ball, the on-ball defender – will then take opposite corner. So in this case, the guy that you were cutting and corner well, defender. That, that, that's, a good, that's a good point. And thank you for the explanation. My, my first of all, let me say this. I think in a clinic, you try to share with your colleagues your, your doubts, okay? Because that's what can probably help your fellows, okay? I, I don't think in a clinic you go there and you tell him, look, we do this and we're great in doing this because that's ridiculous, okay? And you will always find somebody that will offer you a challenge in whatever you do, okay? So, uh, talking about that, uh, the, the thing is, I think that that baseline cut, that baseline cut and the drift to the baseline, it's effective only against the drop, okay? So, a containing defense, okay? Against an aggressive defense, I think you need to hold and then throw the ball ahead and, you know, and beat the rotation with the pass. Now, what is the problem? What is the problem? The problem is that you, you're putting a lot of responsibility on your players in reading that. Because during the game, it's not going to be drop for 40 minutes. And all of a sudden, there might be, you get used to do the baseline cut and the baseline drift. And now all of a sudden, you find a, a big trap on the ball. And you're going to the baseline. You know, or they're doing that kind of jump switch that you mentioned, and you're leaving, okay, and you're helping the defense because you, uh, you go away from the guy who's in trouble because he's been double teamed, okay? So my, always my, you know, my inner fight is, is it too much to ask to my players to read that situation? Or I, I, don't have, I don't have an answer to tell you the truth because I cannot have a defensive call if I don't know what the defense is going to do. So the only thing we can do is read and react. And that is a constant, let's say, inner fight that I have because I think maybe I'm overcoaching. Maybe I'm asking them too much. How can I make it more simple for them? And honestly, sometimes I'm good at doing it more simple for, the, for my players. Sometimes I'm not. And I realize even late that I'm complicating the game maybe for them because I'm asking to read too much. So where is, where is the limit between giving them the opportunity and encourage them to read and teach them how to read and react that theoretically should be an encouragement to play more their game, okay? And play more free. But sometimes if they can't, 
read properly and react properly, they end up thinking too much and now they play worse and they think that you as a coach are trying to overcoach them. Ooh. That's been, it's, I've been coaching for so many years and I'm still there and I don't have an answer. And, you know, I, probably I'm dumb because I've been, with, I've been an assistant to so many amazing coaches in Europe and in America and, and I'm still here and I'm still asking myself, how can I make it simple for them and still how can I encourage them to read? Because when you read and react properly, man, it's exciting, you know, when you see. Uh, so to answer your question, against aggressive defense, we should not execute that back cut because that leaves the ball ender without an outlet. Is there anything you've had success with in your practices in developing that read and react that you just talked about where they, you know, you mix the defenses or whatever it is so that they have to on the fly develop those skills a little bit. I, I try, I try to do what we all do, you know, having, having a coach similar defenses, uh, all those things where you tell the defender and the baller cannot see head or sway or whatever. Uh, I do. I do all the normal things that everybody does. To tell you the truth, and and, uh, and uh, sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it's more complicated. And I keep thinking that I should be able to find a way to make reading more easy for my players. Because sometimes I realize that for my player, for my players, either either here or in any other situation, it, it was easier to go through calls. You know, and. You know, in this action, you always pop. In this action, you always roll. Think about a big man, a fine man. A fine man who set a screen and rolls. Sometimes his man is way down, okay? So maybe he should just go short roll or pop, okay? And if he's not a shooter, he'll go second side. If he's, a, if he's an aggressive blitz on the ball, an aggressive trap on the ball, maybe he should just go very short roll and give him an outlet there. Because if he goes deep, we lose him. So... For a roller, it's very, I mean, you should have a feel, you know, for not everybody's Tim Duncan who knows every time whether he has, if he has to go short or deep or pop or whatever. And, and it's very, very difficult. You can solve that with calls. So you say, in this action, you always roll deep. In this action, you always pop. You know, in this action, you always short roll. And then it's you that need to be smart and call the right action depending on what the defense does. But in my opinion, that's not basketball. I, I, I can't do it. There are great coaches who are capable to do that. Amazing coaches who can do that like if they had a joystick and they help their players. Because they, you know, through a, an amazing set of calls, of very basic, quick calls, they help the team. I can't. That's not how I'm wired. And so I, let me just share my frustration. And I apologize for taking your time. I'm sorry. No, I appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. You're welcome. Hey, Coach. So I see, I see Darwin Ham, and I want to take my hat off. Hey. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I just wanted to say thank you for doing this. I love you. I miss you. I hope you're safe. Uh, I have to jump on another call, but thank you. I thank you, you very man. much, you man. Your family are doing well. Thank you so much for finding the time. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank, thank you. you, Coach. Thank you. Later, guys. Coach. Yes. When do you cut the weak side corner guy off the shake pick, pick and roll action? What is your timing? Timing is as soon as the ball ender is coming off the screen. Just as Thanks. soon as it's coming off the screen. And by the way, I would also I also like sometimes that instead of cutting, okay, because you saw a clip that where, where the defender of the cutter, okay, left the guy and basically switched and went to, towards the corner to the guy who was drifting to the corner. Do you remember that clip? And then we got the shooter on the other side. Okay? Yeah. Sometimes I think it's also smart not necessarily to cut, but just walk to the block and contain with a screen your own defender. So you prevent him from switching out. If he sees that his teammate is still stunting or overshifting on the ball. 
I don't know if it makes sense without throwing it. Do you mean switching on to the roller or switching on to the shake guy? No, I'm saying, I'm saying, no, no, no. Look at, look at the, let me see if I find, if I find that clip. Can you hold one second? Okay. Here we go. Watch the defender of the corner guy, the guy that is leaving. Okay. He leaves him and he's getting ready to switch out to Sergio Rodriguez that is drifting to the corner. Correct? Yes. This clip, the offense is good enough to go second side. My point is that sometimes we, what you can do here is that the corner player, Moraschini, okay, instead of leaving, he can just walk towards his defender and screen him. So when Sergio Rodriguez is, drift, is drifting to the corner, he cannot switch out to Sergio Rodriguez. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. But to, to go back to your question, the, the timing is number zero, 00 is coming off the screen. Moraschini should already go. It's even late in this clip. You should go when the guy starts to use the screen. Because if he goes slowly, he might interfere with the roller. So I want him to just go. Thank you. Thank you. If we don't have any other question, I would move to the pick and roll defense. Okay, here we go. Talking about pick and roll defense, and this is something that I've seen Coach Pop for years uh, try to emphasize this, and uh, it was never enough because that's the key of pick and roll defense, which is take up the distance between you and the ball handler. Because for whatever reason, all our players are scared to get into offensive players at every level. And they always jump to the air or they always jump to the position rather than going to the hip of the ball handler and take up that distance between them and the ball handler. So we started, first of all, as a push team. We wanted uh, from day one to become a push team, a team that was going to push the ball to the sideline or to the baseline. We thought that this could have been the most, uh, let's say, the, the better choice for our personnel and for the way most of the teams in the EuroLeague were structured, okay? So we try to work on push. And you see in this clip, the major point of emphasis right in a clip where we don't do it well. You see, you see my ball handler, my, the defender of my ball handler, Amedeo de la Valle, he's on, on uh, Wilbekin here, number one, and he jumps to a position rather than jump to his hip, to his left hip, and try to force him to dribble into the big. As a result of that, because you jump to the air here, okay, and you even cross your fit, he just has a quick crossover and he takes a wide open shot. The reason why this clip is, is in is because the point of emphasis of the push defense. Point of emphasis of the push defense, number one, every pick and roll defense, get up, get up into the offensive player. Okay, uh, just hold on a second, I, want, I need this, okay. Second point of emphasis, uh, whatever you do in pick and roll, which is not an aggressive hedge or show or whatever, every time you do a drop or a push, there will be situations where the ball handler will attack your big. So to, to stay in the play for the small is a huge point of emphasis if you want to build a defense uh, based on uh, pushing to the sideline or dropping. Because the fact that the big in this kind of defenses is not impacting the ball allows the ball handler at some level to attack. And if he attacks, Okay, it's gonna be it's gonna be a problem. The second thing, the third thing is that we also implemented, of course, the jump switch on the sideline on handoff plays to keep the ball on the side and then jump into a push. Anyway, in the continuation of the play, you see that there is another screen, and now and now trying to push the ball handler number 14 will attack the big and Michael Roll here should keep pursuing the ball and 
as soon as the of his of his men, or as you say, as as soon as you see as he sees the numbers on his back. Okay, he should just go into the big leg here on Tariq Black and try as much as he can to keep him off the board. And by the way, you see the Sergio Rodriguez because he's so concerned of Scott will baking is forcing us to play four on four defense, which is not what we want to do. Okay, we would like to have Sergio Rodriguez here inside the paint, and if the ball handler is clever enough to skip the ball from here to here, he will close him up. Okay, but here in this clip, you've seen a lot of bad stuff, and you have seen starting with a good thing, which is the 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 switching here to keep the ball pushed, okay, which is good, and force the ball handler to far out to reroute his dribble, okay. Now you start seeing a couple of bad things. The first one we see is Sergio Rodriguez allowing us to play four on four, okay. Now, now you see the, the small attack in the big, and you don't see enough of a sway of a shift from Luis Scola. Luis Scola is playing with his arms down, he's playing below the line that goes from the ball to his man. Okay, he's in a 90 degrees angle, which is not good because if we would commit himself to stop the dribble penetration, he will give up a shot here in the corner. Okay, so basically. Luis is not doing nothing, okay? But we, I mean, we love him and respect him, okay? Because he's an Hall of Famer, so we can't tell him anything. But besides joking, you see Michael Roll here is, he doesn't put his body on the big who's rolling. And we waste the good contest at the rim by Caleb Tarceski. We waste it because Tariq Black gets the offensive rebound. So basically, Tariq Black gets an offensive rebound between three of our players. Watch. You have Vlado Mitzel, you have Sergio Rodriguez, you have Michael Roll, and nobody takes care of the roller. So stay in the play once you're big, which is a magic rule of uh, everything that happens defensively, especially in pick and roll, drop or push where we will supposed to have a lot of situation where the small will attack the big, staying the play is a key. And by the way, that's, that's an interesting thought on how you try to build teams because it's not a case that recently, most of the teams that have been successful in the Euroleague have big guards. More or less, maybe, uh, you can see it's a trend that you can see in the NBA. I don't know. But in Europe, big guards are helping a lot in these situations. Another point of emphasis in the push. We're talking about the concept of the push defense. Here you see Spanulis, one of the best ball handlers in Europe. And cross back. The, the, the push in the middle, more or less, becomes like a drop, of course. You're trying to force the ball angle to go sideways and then the screen is in the middle so basically it becomes like a drop. Luis Scola here is dropping a lot because he's guarding Milutino who is a great roller. Okay? And this is the rule. If the ball angle goes sideways you keep pursuing the ball. There is nothing that involves the big that high. The only time where a switch might occur is below the broken line here below the b win logo, between, between the b win logo, the head of the referee, and the charge circle here. Here, switches might happen, but not here. So here, Michael Roll is doing the right thing because he sees on the cross back, he sees Spanulis going sideways, parallel to the baseline. So he keeps pursuing him, and he tries to get back in front of him, while Luis Scola is taking care of the bid. So no switches when there is a crossback, no overreaction by the bid, okay? He fakes, 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 and he drops. 
Here you see another jump switch here, good jump switch, and you keep the ball to the side. That's a direct consequence of the idea to keep the ball pushed, okay? So even on that handoff, you keep the ball to the side. Here we are. Again, you keep it pushed. And now, the, what I would like to show you and make a point is the high bump, okay? So first line of the defense is, is responsible in pick and roll situation to be the first helper, okay? And you see here, here we go. There was, there was the big ear getting ready to bump the roller. And then he understands that he's not a, he's not a threat. So he gets back in boxing out his men. One thing that we added in our push defense, and this is very common, I would say, in the Euro. So we try, we try to weak a lot of people in the middle. So here we go, we send him left. But that's the key. I think if you send, if you send the ball ender towards his weak hand, you need to add the big higher so that he doesn't let him cross over and go to his strong hand, the right hand. To me personally, it doesn't make sense if you, like in the clip before, here, we didn't, here we generally pushed Spanulis because Spanulis is very good with his right and his left. So I didn't bother my players telling them you have to keep him left or whatever. Just send him to the sideline. And but this is what happened if you don't have Spanulis and you have a player here that you think is weak with his left hand, so you force him left. If you force him left and you want to take advantage of his, let's say, limitation with the left, your big has to be high. Your big has to be here because if you let him cross back, now he's going to his right hand. And that's something that sometimes we don't keep... Uh, I don't know, we don't keep clearly in mind. Sometimes we question, this player is much better if he goes to his right, he drives. If he goes to his left, he, shot, he stops for a jump shot. If he is a better passer here, he's a better passer there. I, I don't know. I, I would just, I don't want to get caught in all that because that's too much thinking for me and my players. My point is, if we want to keep him on, on one specific end, the big has to be there. Otherwise, the crossback will force us to adjust the defensive spacing. And defensive spacing is as important as offensive spacing because defensively, you prepare your shift, your rotation, who's bumping, who's doing this, who's doing that. Now, you let the offense flip easily their side where they are attacking. Now, your, your, your spacing defensively has to be changed. This one is a good one because we weaken, the big is high at the point of the screen. The defender of Julian Stone, number five, is in a tremendous switch with his open arms, okay? Open arms, he just is just at the elbow. There is no space whatsoever for the ball angle, okay? There is no baseline drift, and here we go. I think it's a great defensive clip. Everybody's moving, everybody's touching. We cut their spacing. If offensively, we want to take care of our spacing and our timing. Defensively, we got to think exactly the opposite. We want to take, we want to attack the spacing of the offense, crowding some specific areas, and we want to break their timing. How can you break their timing? Maybe with a little denial of some passes. Maybe being more aggressive uh, on the hip of the ball handler. Maybe... Uh, fronting some specific catches like the, post, the low post catches. You can do a lot to destroy the timing of the offense. And you just destroy the timing of the offense, now it goes down to athletic ability. If you have, a, if, if, you're, if the offense team is much more athletic than, than you are, okay, you might, you might still suffer. But I think overall, I think it's important to, with two parameters. The two parameters that are easy to understand are spacing and timing. Offensively, we want to emphasize those. Defensively, we want to attack those. Very, very basic. I'm sorry. Okay. So let's, let's keep moving.
We said we were weakening in the middle. Another, another uh, clip about weakening the player in the middle. And again, spacing, crowd. Okay, here, the point of this clip is very simple. You try to weaken, okay? And I think Tarceski does a good job because he was at the point of the screen and he starts retreating. And Luis, he's in a good position to take away the driving here. And because we can drop back, drop back, drop back, Tarceski makes a great play and he managed to deflect the lob for the dunker. What I would have liked to see more is my defensive guard here, which unfortunately is too concerned about Scott will bake him. And you see, he's leaving too early. I would like him to stay a little bit longer and take a chance of a pass to will bake him. And that's a good clip. Now, the problem now is understand what kind of player, if you push, what kind of player is screening? Is he a shooter or is not a non-shooter? Especially on side pick and roll. In this clip versus, F versus Fenerbahce, we're pushing and we consider Geoffrey Laverne number 77, not a shooting threat, even if he's an okay shooter. But in this game, I remember we, we, wanted, we wanted to import a jump shot from their base because that's Fenerbahce, that's a team with amazing guards like uh, Nando De Colo, uh, um, uh, Lucas, the Greek point guard. Uh, so a lot, lot of shooters, uh, Gigi Datome. So we wanted to, you know, if, if they had to beat us, we said, let force them to beat us with the big shooting. So we consider older bigs like centers. And we see that on the pop, we get back with the big year. And we close out short, as we like to say, so we don't run Geoffrey Laverne off the three-point line. We stop halfway, we stunt with the uh, Michael Roll number 10, and you know, we force him into a contested shot. Now, it's different if the four man, or if the, if the big, is a big who can shoot, okay? And now you see, you apply a normal push here, you push to the sideline, and the guy pops, boom, of course, you give up a three. This, 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 was, this is a nice clip because it was quite early in the season, and we hadn't, let's say, worked a lot or enough on what we call the late switch. We start slowly trying to implement the concept of late switch against a, a shooting big that is screening the ball. And watch this clip. So we have here, uh, this player here, the four men of Brindisi, he screen. here we go, screens and it pops. Now, the rule should be, we're pushing and late switching. That means on the screen and roll, the ball ender should leave the ball, the big should take the ball quite aggressively and the small will fly to the, to the big man who is popping. And here we do it a little too slow. You see De La Valle number zero, zero, who reacts slowly, he's focused on the pass, he's looking at the ball and that makes him slower. And he still gives up a shot, okay? The idea of the late switch that you, you have seen used by everybody, there is nothing new here, the idea of late switching is that you don't want to involve four or five players in a rotation, like when you do, for example, push and full rotate from the weak side, okay? That, that's still a good defense, but I'd rather play more two on two, if possible, rather than involve more players in a rotation. Uh, I didn't have, we, we were not extremely athletic this year, but even if you have an athletic team, I think that the more you manage to limit rotations, the less offensive rebounds you give up. Because if you rotate too much, uh, there will be a lot of situations that the ball will go up in the air and you're still moving and it's difficult to, to put bodies on bodies and, and you know, secure the defensive rebound. And the, there is nothing more frustrating than work your ass off for 19 seconds, then the ball goes up in the air 
And even if you're trying hard, you give up an offensive rebound and a layup. So I'd rather solve as much as possible situation two on two. And uh, the late switch helps us to do that. So here you see we didn't do it very well. We have the idea, but it's not a great execution yet. In the next clip, you will see a little bit better. Here is, this, here is the, shoot, the popping big, and you see basically that on the first dribble, Rodriguez leaves Calates, leaves Calates, and is already going to the shooter, okay? And leaves Calates in the two-point range attacking the big. So we don't give up the three. We might give up a contested long two. Of course, we don't want to go with a layup. Now, after a while in the season, we, are, we realized that we were not consistent with our push. And what was giving us problems was that uh, there were too many quick guards that as soon as we were trying to shift our feet in order to get the stance to push the ball to the sideline, people were driving us. And uh, it's, it's funny if you let me uh, recall a story. One of my first meeting with uh, Coach Hall and the coaching staff, uh, I, th I remember we were preparing a game against uh, uh, Oklahoma City and Russell Westbrook. And, uh, you know, I said something like, uh, why don't we send, uh, I don't know, Russell Westbrook who is left in the middle pick and roll. And I, I remember Coach gave me a look like if I said something not very smart. He said, welcome to the NBA. If you do that, He's gone. I mean, you will probably see the back of his jersey and, and, and the layup because a guy like Russell Westbrook would go full speed. And uh, that's always in my mind. When I, and I probably, have, uh, I probably have a tendency to overreact when I see or when I think I'm facing, even in Europe, a quick guard because I always, I always think if we shift our feet, boom, it's a penetration. So that happened a little bit too much and uh, with my team this year. So we decided to go into a drop. I drop, basically the main difference, as you well know, is that you send the ball ender into the screen. You don't try to send him away from the screen towards the sideline or the baseline. You send the ball and the ball and the ball ender into the screen. And you try to stay as much as you can square with your feet. Okay? So we tried to do this and all day long the discussion was where we want the big. We want the big lower, we want the big higher, and, and so on. And here, here again, it's a decent clip where we keep the same concept that we use in, uh, in the drop, meaning we send the ball in, into the screen, even if we don't pick up the distance with the ball ender and we just chase him. And if there is a cross back, we keep pursuing the ball. We keep pursuing the ball, okay? We don't wanna have switches more or less at the foul line. Okay, we don't want to overreact. We want to keep the body on the bit. A drop, like the, like the push, as we said before, will create more situation where people will attack your big. Okay? And you see, again, the same situation we saw before. Here, Drew Crawford does a decent job in fighting the screen. He stays square. He should not go under. I would like him to chase that guy, but anyway. Okay, on the re-screen, and the setup is good, it fights the screen. But now, here's the thing. First of all, we would like to see Moraschini here bumping the roller, and he doesn't do it, okay? More, now, Drew realized that the guy is going, okay? So basically, now his job is to, as, as much as he can, get into the big legs here and try to prevent an offensive rebound, okay? Remember what we said, more or less between the end of the logo here and the charge circle is where most of the switches will happen. And again, unfortunately, Luis, who could be more here on the same line of the pass, okay? That's another big point, I think. I think we should get better. We have to emphasize being on the shift on the line of the pass. If you are below the line of the pass, it doesn't make any sense. So as a matter of fact, the guard thrives 
the guard drives, Tartseski does a decent job with his body, but we're pursuing hopeless, we're pursuing the ball ender. Why we should just leave the ball ender into Tartseski hands and just get into the bit and maybe steal the short pass. Now we have a good clip about bumping the roller. Here we are. Here we are. So first line of the defense. Even if Aaron White here, the blonde kid here, even if he's guarding Fred Red, who is a terrific shooter, okay, he leaves his man to bump the roller here. And eventually, if the ball is passed to Fred Red, you will run him off the line. Sorry, it's not Fred Red, he's, uh, he's the other kid there. I'm sorry, Fred Red is in the higher part of the video. But this guy is a good shooter too. So I think I appreciate the fact that Aaron White left him to go help and then he get back to him. It's a good clip that be because we took away the roller, we overcrowded the lane for Kalatas, who didn't have space to go. I really like, I really like Vlado Mitzel, who's pursuing the ball and raise his arm to maybe get a deflection, which is something that we always underestimate, the importance of deflection, the importance of the big hand, you know, the size to make pass, pass difficult. And then we take away the drives, contest the shot, clock is running down, turnover. That's a good clip. Again, this is another clip where we bump well with the big from the weak, from the weak side. Here's a pick and roll coming. Okay, we send him into the screen. Rodriguez, Vlado Mitzel is on the back. Not bad. Here you see Michael Roll number 10 doing a better job in getting into the legs of the big. He sees that. He sees that Corey Higgins is attacking uh, our, our center here. And he lives in and goes right into Tomic here to prevent a short pass. Not a bad job. Then we run off the line Abrinas, the shooter. And you, we, talk, we talked about a lot of situation. When you have a drop or a push, I already said this, you have a lot of situation where guards will attack out there. And I think uh, it might be helpful uh, to share with our bigs a concept that to me is quite helpful. I call it the defending the shooting shoulder. I mean, when you see a guard attacking you and you are a big, try to drop step and go with your frame toward his, the shoulder of the hand that he will supposedly use to shoot the layup in order to create a good angle for your verticality. If you stay on the inside shoulder, it will be almost impossible to have the right, uh, let's say, position for verticality. Watch, watch Budaitis here. is not great, but I think it's good enough because you see, he drops down and he almost covers with his body the right shoulder of the guard, you see, and force the guard to shoot over his extended arm. If we would have stayed with his chest on the left shoulder of that guard, first of all, it would have been impossible to even imagine any kind of verticality. It would have been easier for the guard to bump into him and get the, and get the foul and the layup. And third, he would have exposed himself to an extended move by the guard for an easier layup. I think it's, 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 uh, it's an okay uh, action here by number seven Gudaitis who takes away the angle to the defender, to the offensive player. Now, we talked a lot about shifting, whether it's a push or it's a drop. I think that it's very helpful to work on a positioning of people who are shifting as close as possible to the line of the pass. Here you have a good example. Watch Moraschini. Moraschini is here guarding the corner shooter, okay? And watch. Imagine the lines, okay? Imagine the lines that goes from the ball ender to a theoretical receiver. 
and Moraschini is quite close to that line, okay? The further you are from this line, the deeper you might help and the more problematic will be for you to get back to your men. The higher you stay on the line of the past, the more you can somehow influence the cutter and get back on, get back and even steal or deflect the pass. Okay? That's the same concept that I showed you before when I showed you Luis Scola in a 90 degrees angle shifting from the corner. That's too low because now if the ball attacks that guy, he will kick out to the corner very, very simple. You know, you gotta be, you got to be higher and closer to the line of the pass, I think. You see again another clip of decent shift. Okay. So watch, watch Mitzov. Mitzov is guarding Jerebko. Okay. He's quite higher to the line of the pass from Shved to Jerebko. So he impact, he might impact the roller here. Watch now. Even if Sved will try to pass the ball to Jerebko, and of course Jerebko maybe could space differently or better. But my point is, Vlado Mitzov is quite close to the line that goes from the ball handler to his guy. And same thing does Sergio Rodriguez. He's on the same line of the ball and his man number three. He might take a chance of a backdoor cut. I know, I agree with you, but that's a chance that I would like to take. That's the gamble that I would like to accept, okay? Rather than be lower and more containing in my shift and allow the ball to go deeper. I think we can have a first line of the defense. The first line of the defense is formed by the shift guy here and is formed from the back guy who is bumping the roll. I think that the less we involve people from the corners, the better it will be for our defense. This is a good switch. At one point, we will need to switch. Okay, and here we pass out well. Luis Cola comes from the weak side to triple switch and let Rodriguez go out to the corner rather than fighting the big. Okay, uh, we were not special in this triple switch. We were just okay. And I think that you need to practice a lot and you need to be, you know, efficient if you want to really rely on that. But it's quite, it's quite decent, I think. A late switch here, which is good, you see. Like we talked before. Dublevich, the guy with the beard, very, very good shooter. He's a pick and pop fineman. Very difficult to handle, to handle. Because you, you, unless you want to hedge, okay? If you want to drop, you need to work a lot on this. And I think my players did a good job in this game. You see a triple switch on the weak side, end up in a contested shot. Not bad. Here's the, uh, if I can offer a discussion here, is this. Uh, late in the clock, okay, especially late in the clock. I don't know if this, I, I, I think that, let me, let me see again this clip. I'm fine with triple switch coming from the weak side. Let's say the screen happens here and the triple switch happen, comes from the weak side, okay? It's a longer path for the defense, but it's safer. Watch why. Watch this clip now. Here we go. Watch. Triple switch, too late. Shoot, shoot De La Valle number zero, zero. First of all, he gets rid of his queen, okay? Ayon sets a hell of a screen. But should he let him go? Trusting Moraschini here from the corner, getting him and springing to the sideline, or just do a two on two switch and take away the chance of a three. Late in the game and watch the clock. Late in the clock, 
why don't we stay two on two and there is no time for the offense to work that post-up advantage. I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'm just throwing you the doubt for you to think about it and, and you know, open up a discussion. And you will see that. I think I have another clip for you. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Good, good. We switch and we stay two on two. We don't have a triple switch. Even if theoretically, theoretically here, the big who is on the, on the small here could get Tibor Plyce and let Shelby Mack go to the corner. But first of all, the way the action is developing, you don't know on which side of the roller Shelby Mack will be. Might be here, might be under, might be on the other side. So I think it's safer on the strong side, don't run too many triple switch because in this case, if you leave Bubois, the shooter in the corner, open because his man leaves, try to go back here to Plyce, that's going to be a wide open three. While Shelby Mack, he handles it two on two and he does a pretty good job. He handles it pretty, pretty well and now he fights, he throws the post. Aaron White is coming from the weak side. Vlado Mitsov sinks level of the ball and we end up in a good play, in a good defensive play. So my point of, my point of discussion is what about not triple switching on the strong side, especially okay, on a shake action, which is extremely dangerous because the ball handler can see the shooter easily and, and, and get a three-point shot. And finally, we used a little bit of this switch. Sometimes our drop was not working. Sometimes our push at the beginning of the year was not working. We used a little bit of a hedge, but more with the four men, with the five men, it was difficult. And uh, with so many shooters spread on the court, on, on the court, if you, uh, you know, if you have uh, more hedges with the five rolling side, they can tear apart your defense. So uh, we used a little bit more of switches. And as you see in the next two clips, the final two clips, and then we open up the discussion again, we tried to blitz the ball anger we kind of zone on the roll. You see, watch. Jarebko is coming. He screens. Okay. We switch with Luis Cola. Not the best matchup that you would dream. Sveds guarded by Luis. So we give up the roller and we zone on the baseline with the three remaining players. And as soon as he goes a little bit, Michael Roll goes a little bit here, like in a 2 3 zone, and then he double teamed the ball. And you might keep the double team or you might basically run a switch and get back to your, let's say, normal matchup. And of course, you need the cooperation of the ball handler that, because if he, if he doesn't take the right decision, he looks, everything looks great. Okay. You see now another time now with the five men. We switch with the five men. We don't want to lift that Ceski on him, which is quite active. And Michael Roll does a good job here in faking to go with Booker, okay? And then he lifts him and comes back. Comes back, get him, two hands, not bad, we rotate. I think Jeff Brook does a good job in not overreacting against a player that we didn't consider a great shooter, but just an, a good shooter, so we didn't want to give up a, a drive. And you know, it's, it's, it's a good play for all. And we fight the post. And we end up in a fadeaway jumper. I think it was a good clip, but I, I think the job on the on the ball here, the switch was a little bit more aggressive than before with Luis. Uh, Caleb is doing a little bit more activity against Sved. Here we go, hands, good use on the hands, good X out on the weak side. Not bad, not bad. Unfortunately, we were not consistent in all this all year long, but it's a good base to start over again. So I'm done with my quick review of uh, uh, what we did, uh, uh, let me see.
or what we did defensively on pick and roll. So if you have questions now that you might be interested, I would love to answer you. Hello? Yep. Does anyone have any questions for Coach Messina? Coach, Coach, I have a question. Um, I think you said in your drop coverage, you debated how high up you wanted the big. Did you ever come to clarity on that? That would be the first one. And the second question, I like the concept of attacking the shooting shoulder. So would your foot placement be different if a guy was driving to the right for the big as opposed to driving to the left, assuming he was right-handed? Uh, well, if he's, driving, if he's driving on this side, I will drop step with my, with my right foot, and then I will go. Uh, yeah, it's basically like a mirror, mirroring situation. Yes, for sure. For sure. Okay. Uh, as for, uh, of course, I think that the right answer is to uh, you adjust the position of the big depending on uh, personnel. But overall, uh, we, we decided at, at one point that it was better to have the big at the point of the spoon for one simple reason. Because we tried, we tried to uh, pick up the ball a little higher, and the screen was happening higher, and that was opening up a pocket for the big much further from the ring. Okay? Okay. And now the big needed maybe one dribble or two dribble or longer passes. If you, if you stay lower with the big, that opens up the prospects, okay? and uh, it's worse, I think. So we, 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 got, we got to that. Great, thank you. You're more than welcome. Coach, how about on your, uh, on your late Oh, record? my goodness. I got to stand up. My friend, Chad, how are you doing? I'm so happy to see you. How are you? Miss you and love you, Coach. Happy to see you. Good. Me too. I love you, Chad. I'm so glad to see you. Great to see you. On your late reds, whether it's rollers or poppers, what were you teaching your team on communication? Is that reads? Is it no. feel it? Who's the communicator? How's it communicated? Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, I found very effective to give them, an, for the timing, uh, a, a relation to two dribbles. You know, on the second dribble, regardless, I would, I would encourage my small to fly out. I think that works in most of the situations. And uh, I think that theoretically, uh, the big sees his own man popping. So he should be the leader of the action. But unfortunately, as you will know, most of the times, bigs are less vocal than, uh, than the guards. So you need to push them and enforce that. I think it's very difficult for the guard, unless he's very, very experienced, to understand that he maybe he should leave. Now, one thing that, that, that I, I would like to say is that with the quickness that so many shooters have, I was thinking about, I was thinking about the Bispertans, for example, that we had together. Uh, a player like that so quick, I think that the, the late red, the late switch, should happen a little earlier than usual. It's not a normal switch. I think it's better earlier rather than later, even if we used to call late switch or late red when we work together with the Spurs. Thank you, Coach. You're more than welcome. Hello to Cassandra. Love you. Coach, I got another one for you. Uh, you threw out the triple switch stuff, so it had me thinking. Uh, I know you talked about first line help always bumping the roll yeah. guy when you had that overloaded side, yeah. do you have the same rule in place for a shake? So with that corner guy, are you expecting him up to bump a roll guy in that situation? Who, uh, I think the key, that, as you well know, that's the most difficult situation to cover, of course. Uh, I think what you can do is try to limit the damage if you are already in position. Uh, I mean, I think uh, 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 we, all, we all know and we all were very well learned. And I mean, Coach Pop was so good in teaching this. You have to be already in shift, okay? And then, so then you can run out, okay, to your men. The problem is that when you go like this, okay, because you're late in shifting and now you get caught opposite the ball. So as I think I would, I would insist in showing yourself in the position where you're shifting, 
encourage the skip pass to the Shea guy to the corner rather than, than uh, to the wing and meeting the guy earlier. You know what I mean? Don't mm-hmm. wait. If you get caught and you meet the roller at the 90 degrees, you, there is no way you can get back to the guy who's shaken up. But if you go diagonal from the corner, you leave your guy and go diagonal to just touch the roller higher. Now, if he comes to the, towards the foul line extended, is a quick recovery. And you can still bother that guy or run him off the line. Okay? In that case, probably a good offensive player will probably stay in the deep corner, I think. Okay? But if they are used to just come high, to shake up to the foul line extended, I think if you basically anticipate them coming higher to meet the roller, touch the roller, that gives you a great chance to get back to the shake guy to the foul line extended. I don't know if without the board I've been able to express myself. Yeah, no, I, I, I followed that. One, one quick follow-up question, Please. especially since you were talking about your guys making baseline cuts. Yeah. Would you ever have your guys making that read? So if you had a team that's aggressively tagging in shake situations that oh, – no. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why vision, you know, keep moving your eyes and keep vision. It's very, very important. That's why I think you cannot shift square full body. You got to shift a little bit more diagonally, if it makes sense. You know what I mean? In yep. order, so your feet, your toes are theoretically a little bit more towards the corner and a half court rather than be square and just aim of the opposite rim. Because you would impact the ball big time, but you will be slower in getting back and you will expose yourself to a backboard. Mm-hmm. If you're a little bit more diagonal, you can, you know, stop the ball somehow and still see if the guy is trying to go back to Great. Thanks, Coach. More than welcome. Can I say just something? I mean, I just want to thank you all. Uh, I mean, we can go up, we can go on and talk, but I've seen so many great friends that I haven't seen for a while. I'm glad you're doing well. You're, you're healthy. I hope your family are healthy, and I'm just thankful. Thankful for this opportunity, Ryan. It's a, it's a great thing. I hope you just don't send a letter complaining for the product that you want your money back. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Coach, de- defensively, what are some things, uh, what are some teaching points that you have? What are the important details that you have in terms of for your on-ball defender when he is defending the pick and roll in terms of his hand placement? Are you teaching to take away the early low pocket pass, late high yeah. pass? Yeah. So I, I, I think hand from down. Yes. Up. yes, 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 yes. The early, I thought you made, you said it great. I think the very first, the very first danger is the quick early pocket pass because that opens up a kind of worms. And then as more he dribbles the ball, now the danger is either a, a lob to the big or a skip pass to the corner. So now you should be able to focus, especially if you're big, to raise your arm and try to, you know, make it a little bit more difficult. I think that's a great teaching point. I agree with you. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It's funny because, you know, is this overcoaching? Here's the question. Are we teaching too much? Are we asking too much? I think it's code. I mean, all of these players play video games, and that's what I sell you know, the way that I try to describe it is it's a cheat code defensively. I mean, <laughs> statistically speaking, the early pass is going to be low. The late pass is going to be high. And you're just playing yeah. percentages yeah. and having a cheat code. Yeah. By the way, by the way, I have, I have a, um, talking about numbers and statistics, I, I would like just to share uh, an opinion uh, that we had here with the coaching staff. We discussed this a lot during the year. Uh, as I said, switching is pretty big in this in Euroleague like it is in the NBA. And not many teams are good enough to, to attack the switch. Uh, we are one of that team. Uh, and uh, all of us, we've been really you know, impressed with the idea of getting layups, free throws, or open threes. You know, even us, like uh, when I was with, uh, with the Spurs, we tried to understand how we could get more threes. But, but since everybody is switching, I think 
in terms of player development or you know individual workouts for the players we got to find in our team if we're lucky enough those two three players who can beat one-on-one -on -one the switch and eventually the defense will give up a middle jump shot okay the defense will not give up a layup in that situation okay because that's what the defense wants so are we sure that practicing only floaters and layups or contested layups and threes is the right thing mentally considering that the defense after a switch will probably give us an in-between jump shot i don't know just a thought and i'm not saying that that we need to confuse our players because if the, our philosophy is we want to get layups free throws and threes uh, and we start saying yeah but there is also a situation where we attack switches that most likely we need to be able to go one two dribble and and pull up the jumper okay because that, that's how it is uh somebody has to be good in that and somebody has to work that shot those shots i think uh which is not going backwards uh with the clock but it's just i think uh, seeing more and more what the defense wants to allow you to do and what they give you and you know try to win more games just a thought just a crazy thought from an old person. Any other question, please? What what were some of the teaching points when you when you did jump to your zone? You know, where you kind of trapped the ball handler, jump to the zone. What were some of your rules in that? And how do you think it would apply? I say for the G League, because when I saw that for the G League for us, I think it could be super effective. Uh I've seen a few teams playing zone this year, and uh, it's been quite interesting. I think it's been quite a learning experience. Um, especially, I've seen surprisingly uh, some effective two three zone, more effective than I could expect. Okay, and uh, I've seen two things that I like, and I, I try to implement a little bit. First of all, ball in the middle, handled by the ball handler in the middle. The, the two guards were basically setting themselves with their bodies in order to kind of fennel the ball to the middle. They were not square. You know? They were playing like this, okay? And I'm sorry, from, you, from, from your side is different. Just trying to fennel in the ball end to the middle. And on side pick and rolls, okay, they were pushing. They were basically pushing and forcing the ball and the rear aggressively to go into the center of the zone. And then once the guy was attacking the center, the guards were flying out to the perimeter players so that they could be there once the ball were kick, was kicked out. And they were always playing five on five. So it was an early kind of switch, you know what I mean? They were not sending the ball to the screen and to the middle. Because if, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Because if I'm in a two, three zone, and I have the ball on the wing, and there is one of the two guards there, and now you screen that guy, and you attack the middle, and the second guard takes that one, now you throw the ball ahead, the wing of the 2-3 of the zone is caught in the middle between a shooter on the foul line extended, and maybe a shooter in the corner. Okay? While if you send the ball to the corner, to the same side corner, you push it to that corner, you take away that dribble penetration. So it was really, really... I think uh, two concepts that I, that I think uh, could, be, could be useful for, to implement in any, in any basic zone. And uh, uh, the other thing is, you know, Coach Smith was using back then this point zone that was, you know, pretty difficult to attack. But I think you need a lot of time to implement that, you know, that so when you, when you reverse the, the ball from one side to the other, the low man of the zone comes and it becomes a kind of one three one. Uh, it's fascinating, but it's very, very difficult to have the time to teach it. And uh, that reminds him in, in the dreams. But I think those two things, fennel the ball to the middle when he's in the middle, uh, to, the, to the rim when he's in the middle, and push side pick and roll so the ball cannot come easily to the middle because the basic offense against zone is reverse it and shoot it on the weak side. Okay. Let's send the ball baseline and don't let the reverse easy. Maybe it's working. Who were the teams that were doing that? Who? I don't remember that exactly. 
but I've seen him two, three times. If I, if I recall where and what, ask my assistant we, where we saw the clips and whatever, I'll let you, I'll let you know. It was the Euro League or the Italian League? That was in the Euro League for sure. I'll find it. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Coach. Yes. Ooh. Henry. Oh, my Henry man. How are you? <laughs> Henry, how are you? I'm doing Great well. To you. Coach. Great to see you. I still remember <laughs> when you were in Siena and you were making tons of shots. <laughs> That's a long time ago. That's a long time ago. Hello? I uh, uh, appreciate you doing this. I hate uh, you. <laughs> well, I hated uh -huh. that you took us out of the uh kept me from the final four when you were at Cheska, I think, with uh was it Papa Lucas and Vanderpool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh um, that was not a bad uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was chess the smoldish hit everything right yeah. please tell me uh teaching you have multiple coverages here as far as defensively how you're talking about the on ball and the big but speaking about the weak side did you have, did the guys have trouble uh, picking up whether they should be pulled all the way in or in a drop and you want to guard a two on two now and maybe they don't have to pull over as much and then at times you're triple switching? What was the language that you were able to communicate each coverage and how, how well were the guys able to pick it up to be able to read and react in that moment and do it well? Uh, it's a great question. And I tell you, I tell you honestly, I think that we were overall better defensively because defensively we lacked athleticism, but we had, we, it was easier for us to read defensively than offensively, if that makes sense. In our offense, I realized at some point that I had to go easier and more basic. New team, not a lot of practice time, uh, could not ask them more. And while defensively, they allowed me to be more, you know, a little bit more crazy and try different stuff because they were, they were smart understanding and especially in what, you're, in what you're saying, in understanding when and how they could pull, okay, and, you know, enough to, and, and you take advantage of the fact that we do not have a, a defensive three seconds rule and when to stay locked up on the shooter. Um, I think overall we had uh, we we had we were quite we, we were not we were we were not bad and if we would have been a little bit more athletic we could have switched more I would have liked to switch more and uh, uh, we we couldn't do that because of the way we were uh, and in terms of uh, even I think uh, uh, the communication was was very in terms of wording we kept very basic very basic we didn't use a lot of uh, you know, fancy words or colors or whatever. And, uh, and I think that helped us. We tried to keep it simple and it was easier for, for the kids to, to get it. I, I had an experienced team. I had an, honestly an experienced team and they, they, I mean, they, made, they put a lot of effort. Yeah. I don't know if, if that answered the, the question, but I think yes. overall, for us in Europe, and you have played here, you've been a great player here in Europe for many years, I think it's easier defensively, I think. While offensively, uh, and a lot of great players that come from the NBA take a lot of time to understand that. I mean, you put the ball down and everybody's already there. While in the NBA, it's not like that. In America, it's not like that. So I think players get ever, it's a little bit more simple to adjust defensively to do that rather than adjust offensively, I think. And overall, I think this forces you to spend, forces you, it's even more fun probably, to spend more time on the offense in practice, I think. As long, to, to go back to your question, as long as you have, uh, let's say, a good attitude in compete your ass off defensively, even if it's not perfect, I think the concepts are easier, are easier to grasp and implement. While offensively, you need more time. You need more time. It's not enough to compete. You need more time to learn the reads. For example, you need to have one or two players who can skip the ball from one side to the other. Because in these days, if you only do the basic reversal, players are so quick, boom, boom, that you gotta, have, you gotta be perfect in every pass. 
So if you have a guard, you mentioned Papa Lucas, or David Banterpool, big guards who can skip the ball from one side to the other. I mean, that helps a lot. So uh, that's why offense is probably more difficult yeah, to work and to grasp here in, uh, uh, in Europe, I think. But it's just a feel. Just a feel. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Best of luck to you. Thanks. Ryan, are we okay? Yeah, does anyone else have any more questions for Coach? Coach, thank you very much for, for all of your time and, and effort and, and to your staff's effort in, in putting this together for us and, and taking the time to, to share. I, I hope, I hope uh, uh, to have been of a small help to uh, some of you and uh, that you go home at least uh, not thinking that you waste your time. Uh, I, I, again, I, again I, would love, I would love to thank everybody because I had the opportunity to see again a lot of friends. And uh, uh, I wish you the best. Stay healthy with your family. Uh, and I hope this thing will pass soon. And we can go back to the court and uh, uh, you know, keep playing, keep, keep seeing basketball and do basketball together. Okay? Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Best of luck. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Great job. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Coach. Ryan. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Coach. Ryan. Appreciate it, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it, Thank Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Thanks, Coach. Ryan. Thanks Ryan. Thanks, Ryan.